before we get started, I'd just like to express gratitude. You'll see many images of documents here, and I'm especially grateful to the uh, Community of Christ, also known uh, formerly as the RLDS Church, who have provided uh, the images for all of the Joseph Smith translation manuscripts that you'll see very graciously. Uh, you'll see manuscripts from uh, the jo Joseph Smith's revelations. Those photos are courtesy of Robert Woodford and Jeff Johnson from the Joseph Smith Papers Project Archives. And all of the other photos, a few are personal, but most of them are, are courtesy of LDS.org, and I'm grateful for their help in this. Joseph Smith told us that, visions, that he had visions that roll like an overflowing surge before my mind. And that surge, I believe, was more powerful and more consistent than we often realize. And it's my hope that we can come to understand that a little bit better today. He had a more complex and powerful revelatory life than many of us have known heretofore. Part of the reason, part of the problem we have with understanding this surge is that we typically compartmentalize the revelations that Joseph received. So we could take this, this surge of revelations and we would normally say some of those revelations are revelations that will go in the Doctrine and Covenants, some in the Pearl of Great Price, and some in the Joseph Smith Translation, even though the Joseph Smith Translation and Pearl of Great Price are, are overlapping books. But uh, this is not really the way that we should perceive it if we want to understand how things were for the early saints and Joseph Smith. We would come closer if we said that these, this, these surge of revelations came to Joseph Smith, and from Joseph Smith they went into these different compartments that we usually think of them. But even that is slightly inaccurate. I think we understand it better if we say that the surge flowed from the Lord to Joseph Smith, and from Joseph to the saints, and that it was eventually, over time and sometimes over a long period of time, that they ended up in the different compartments in which we have them today and, and in the way that we think of them today. And taking away those compartments and understanding how they, these revelations went to the, the prophet and then the saints will help us understand how the Lord worked with them. As we do this, we have to ask ourselves a question. How much access did the saints have to the revelations as they came? We know that initially, beginning in 1830, they could all get access to the Book of Mormon and, and the information in there. But revelations like this one that ended up in the Doctrine and Covenants, and like this one, which was, uh, will end up in the Pearl of Great Price, but was part of the Joseph Smith translation process, or what Joseph called the New Translation. He, he called it the New Translation. We now call it the Inspired Version of the Joseph Smith Translation. Those were originally, and for quite some time, only on pieces of paper dictated to Joseph's scribes by Joseph. And so we wonder how much access did the saints have to these before they were put in book form. Well, we know that at least to some degree, people were making copies of especially the Joseph Smith translation or the, the new translation of the Bible and circulating them among themselves. John Whitmer had made a copy for himself. Edward Partridge had at least a partial copy. Franklin Richards had a partial copy. And there may be many more that we're unaware of or that haven't survived. As the saints wanted so much the information that was available through these revelations, these copies, personal copies, were made and were circulated around. And I'm uh, doubtless they spoke with each other about what they learned. Eventually, some of these would be published in some of the church's publications, such as you can see here, the Prophecy of Enoch ends up in the Evening and Morning Star. And, of course, many of the revelations would end up in the Book of Commandments. But this was later. This took some time. For us to really understand what was going on, we should first of all realize that these were all revelations that Joseph received, given to him from the Lord. And even if no one else had access to them, Joseph's ability to teach the saints was determined by these revelations flowing to him in one continuous flow. Of course, then he taught some of the leading brethren, and then he and the leading brethren taught the saints at large. And so in one way or another, they were gaining access to these revelations. If we were to look here and see what Joseph says, he says, to the joy of the little flock, and then he says, which numbered about 70, did the Lord reveal the following doings of olden time from the prophecy of Enoch. And then he gives us the, the revelation of Enoch, which ends up being Moses 6 and 7. That gives us the idea that if the flock which numbered 70 is receiving this with joy, that most of that flock was receiving in one form or another those revelations, and the saints were getting this information as it came to their prophet. 
Some of the questions that we want to answer today as we look at this continuous flow are when were the revelations received? And in particular today we're going to look at, at the revelations surrounding the translation of the Old Testament. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. What is the interaction between the varying revelations and what kind of teaching sequence did this create as the Lord taught his saints line upon line? Now this study, the, the study that we'll talk about today is only recently possible because of work that has been done by other scholars. For a long time, no one really had access to the manuscripts that were Joseph's dictation to his scribes of the new translation of the Bible. Robert J. Matthews uh, began that study in, in conjunction with uh, help from the Community of Christ or the RLDS Church, and all work really stands on his shoulders. Eventually, he and Ken Jackson and Scott Fowling created an invaluable aid, Joseph Smith's new translation of the Bible, the original manuscripts, which is a transcription of all of these manuscripts showing what was crossed out, what was written above the line, when there were scribe changes, you can tell from the handwriting and so on. That kind of information, the, the ability to now go through and see what was happening with the manuscripts has opened up new avenues of study. And today's study is one of those avenues, and it casts in many ways light on how we understand many Doctrine and Covenants revelations as well as the early history of the church and Joseph's revelatory experience. To do this, we're going to spend just a few minutes trying to establish a timeline of when certain revelations were received. And so I've created this calendar to help us understand some of these things. We're not going to look at all of the revelations that were in the Doctrine and Covenants, but really the revelations that were received in close conjunction with what we call Old Testament Manuscript 1. When Joseph began the translation of the Bible, he started translating in the Old Testament. And we'll see uh, in a little while when, but at some point the Lord told him to stop and begin translating the New Testament. That first pass through the Old Testament, he would later go on and do it again on a different manuscript. That first pass through the Old Testament we call Old Testament Manuscript 1. It is from there that we receive the wonderful new revelations that become the Book of Moses and other information. That's the period that we'll be concerned with today. It's too large to look at all of the Joseph Smith translation in one day. but. For today, we'll look at Old Testament Manuscript 1 and the revel other revelations that are received in conjunction with that. We'll begin with in early April, portions of section 20 and sections 21 through 23 were received in very early April. And then we have no record of Joseph receiving more revelations the rest of April or in May. But in June, we don't know exactly when, he receives a marvelous revelation that has become Moses chapter 1. We, we do not know if this was because he had started translating the Bible or if this revelation came and then he started translating the Bible. It may, it may be the latter. In any case, a marvelous revelation was unfolded to him, the import of which we'll talk more about in a moment. As he received this revelation, Ken Jackson, who has gone through the manuscripts and seen when it seems like he was stumbling and when uh, things were just flowing, he describes this as coming from the prophet's lips without the slightest contemplation, hesitancy, or uncertainty. This revelation just flowed. Didn't, he didn't have to work through wording or anything else. It came as a pure revelation. This is a copy of the Bible that Joseph Smith used. You can see uh, he paid three twenty-five dollars for it. I'm sure it's worth a little bit more than that today. But at this point, maybe before, and it was the impetus for receiving Moses 1, if not after receiving Moses chapter 1, he went through this Bible that he's per he'd purchased from Grandin Books uh, and started translating it, receiving revelation from God uh, as he did so. Oliver Cowdery was his scribe to begin with. Uh, by revelation, Emma was told when other scribes couldn't help that she should help, and so we'll find times when Emma is the scribe. We'll also see that John Whitmer and uh, Sidney Rigdon were frequently scribes. So that happened in June. In July, revelations that would become sections 24 through 26 were received. In August, section 27. Uh, towards the end of September, and we'll return to these revelations, section 28 through 31 and the middle of October, section 32. Now, this leaves us with the question, when were the uh, translations taking place? And we don't know precisely during that time period, but we can put some things together. You'll see here 
uh, the heading given by, uh, this was by Oliver Cowdery, a revelation given to the elders of the church on the first book of Moses. And so that seems, this ends up being Moses 2 through 3. That seems to be a cohesive unit, a revelation that was received maybe over a period of days, maybe all at once, but a revelation that was given as a cohesive unit. Shortly thereafter, we're not sure how long after, uh, we see a heading that is uh, written to say a revelation concerning Adam. This will be Moses five, or 4 through 543, actually the first part of verse 43. They considered that a revelation concerning Adam, again, marking it as kind of a cohesive unit, perhaps received all at once or in a period close together. It's difficult to know exactly when those two revelations were received. The, the, what we can say is they were received after Moses chapter 1, and they were received before October 21st. We know that because the next heading was October 21st. So anything before that was received before October 21st, but we don't know exactly when in those period of months. We do have a few clues. Uh, one of them, it comes again from this heading that says it was a revelation. Moses 2 through 3 was a revelation given to the elders of the church of Christ. That's very similar to a heading we see at the beginning of section 29, which you can read says a commandment, uh, as the grammar there is a little tough, but it's given to the church of, or to the church of Christ, given to six elders of the church. The language is very similar. Most of the time, revelations aren't said as being given to the elders, but given to Joseph Smith or just a revelation. These are specific that they are given to the elders of the church. And, and you note the similarity between the wording there. That may give us a clue. We can't be sure, but we do know when section 29 was given. Moses 2 through 3 happened somewhere in these months, and during those months, section 29 was received. It was received at a conference of the church that was held September 26th through 28th. It, section 28 was received just before. Section 29 was received either the day before or it seems more likely received during the conference. It may have been given just before and intended to be read at the conference or it was received at the conference for those elders. The similarity of wording makes me suspect that Moses 2 through 3 was similarly given just before or during this conference as a revelation given to the elders who were at that conference. There were six elders in attendance at that conference. Well, that's an important thing because we'll see how those revelations interact. I suspect that Moses 2 through 3 was given at the same time or just before section 29, both of which seem to be in conjunction with this conference received uh, there. So we'll put Moses 2 through 3 in September, though they could be anywhere between July and the end of October. Moses 5.43b, that's the second half of that verse, through 5.51 was received on October 21st. Section 33 was received towards the end of that month. Section 34 in the middle of November. And then we can read here that the next revelation that is part of the, the uh, Joseph Smith translation was received on November 30th. So that's Moses 5.52 through 6.13. On December 1st, Moses 6.19 through 52 was received. Sometime during the next week, Moses 6:52 through 7:1 was received. On December 10th, an important revelation was received too, but section 35 in particular was important. This said that Joseph was given the keys of the mystery of those things which have been sealed, part of which was probably understanding the things that have been lost from the Bible and, and that translation process. Furthermore, he was told that Sidney Rigdon was to write for him, and the scripture shall be given, even as they are in mine own bosom, to the salvation of mine own elect. From this point forward, Sidney Rigdon will be the scribe for the translation process. This is when Joseph has just met Sidney, and he will be the scribe, except for rare instances when Sidney is gone. You can see right here, and here's a close-up, where the handwriting changes from Whitmer to Rigdon. And so that's, that's a, a way that we can date when that happened. That had to have happened from December, December 10th onward, and it seems that they began writing that day. So then towards the end of December, we also have Moses chapter 7, verse 2 through 8, 12 received, and section 37. This gives us a rather remarkable period. If, if we were to go back to this, you'll see that the latter part of that year was heavy with reception of revelations for Joseph and the saints, an intense period of revelation, in particular the month 
of December, which as you all know, and you can see with the red there, has Christmas in it. Also, Joseph's birthday just before Christmas. My guess would be that they observe these holidays and the translation may have paused for a time. So given the busy month of December, Joseph received 156 completely new verses of Genesis. And if we combine this with all the revelation he received, some of which will end up in the Doctrine and Covenants, he received 195 new scriptural verses overall in that month. It's a remarkable period of revelation for the church. The last month of the official or the year that the church officially exists was a month where the Lord spoke to his people and poured out revelations from heaven. Our timeline continues on with 1831. January 2nd, so you see as soon as the holidays are over, they have New Year's Day and then they begin again, section 38 is received. God gives them section 38. January 5th, section 39 is received. So this gives us a five-week total, a remarkable period of five weeks with New Year's, Christmas, and Joseph's birthday in the middle. 261 new scriptural verses received in that five-week period. The Lord surely blessing his saints in that way. Section 40 is received in the middle of January, and then there was a break as the prophet was told to move to Ohio, and he and Sidney Rigdon moved to Ohio. Uh, and during the getting ready to move and the moving process, the, the translation and revelation stopped for a short time. When he arrived in Ohio, he stayed in the Whitney store, uh, and there was a room there that he did his translation in. You can see they've restored in that room some period furniture that would be similar to the desk he had at which he sat while doing that translation. He begins again once he arrives in Kirtland. February 4th, section 41 is received. February 9th, section 42 is received. In the middle of February, section 43. Towards the end, section 44. And on March 7th, section 45 is received. Again, section 45 is an important revelation concerning the translation of the Bible, because here the Lord says, And now behold, I say unto you, it shall not be given unto you to know any further concerning this chapter until the New Testament shall be translated, and in it all these things shall be made known. Wherefore I give unto you that ye may now translate it, that ye may be prepared for the things to come. At that point they stopped translating the Old Testament and began translating the New Testament. So we ask ourselves, how far had they gotten in the translation of the Old Testament at this point? Somewhere during the months of January through until March 7th, they had gotten from Genesis 5.32 all the way to Genesis 24.41, leaving behind the material that's in the, the Book of Moses and continuing on translating Genesis. We can't know exactly when, but we can make some approximations as to how this happened. If we were to put in this calendar, which has the month of February plus the first month of March in it, you see when these various revelations are received. Some of them are approximate dates. Um, these are the revelations from the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, they work their way through 470 verses of Genesis during this time period. Some of this is not revelation. Much of this is just working their way through the verses, receiving changes and so on. Quite a few changes happen uh, during this portion of Genesis. It must have happened, while the prophet often seemed to work in great bursts of revelation, they must have worked at this fairly consistently to do 470 verses in five weeks. So this would average 94 verses a week. It may not have worked out exactly that way, but the average would be 94 verses a week meaning that during this first week they would get through Genesis 9, during the next week through Genesis 12, through the next one Genesis 17, the next one through Genesis 20, and finally by the 7th of March through Genesis 2441. This will be important because we'll see the, the timing of these revelations uh, helps the saints in an interesting way. Uh, that gives them, if you combine the verses they went through Genesis and the revelations received that will end up in the Doctrine and Covenants, 691 total verses worked through during that five-week period. So if we were to take those two intense five-week periods, there was a small gap in the middle as they moved, but those intense five-week periods, the 10-week total, there are 886 verses that Joseph gives us during that period. It's a marvelous period of revelation. As I've said, December of 1830 may have been the greatest period ever besides the translation of the Book of Mormon for the reception of revelation, something that we would be completely unaware of if we hadn't been able to start figuring out the dates of the revelations associated with the Joseph Smith translation process. Just to help you visualize the concurrency of these revelations that are now in the Doctrine and Covenants and the, uh, the Book of Moses, uh, I've, I've created this graphic. You can see that there's a, not much concurrence in April through July, but sometime beginning in July, we have these revelations overlapping one after the other after the other, and Joseph is receiving them, at, again, not in his mind as separate things, but as a continuous stream 
of revelation from the Lord up through March. Now we ask ourselves, how do the revelations interact? That's where we'll spend the remainder of our time is trying to understand what was the Lord teaching as he gave them these different kinds of revelations. We're going to look today at only four topics. There are more, but these seem to me to be the four most important topics. Understanding what it means to be a prophet, doctrines surrounding the creation and the fall, the concept of the city of Zion, and signs of the time, which are also interrelated with the concept of Zion. We'll begin with the, the idea of being a prophet. I think it's hard for us to understand that at this point, they were trying to understand what it meant to have a modern day prophet in their midst. This was new. And I don't know that even Joseph fully understood what his role was and how he would be continually interacting with the Lord. Certainly, at this point, they understood that Joseph was a translator. He had received the, the translation of the Book of Mormon. I think they also understood he, somewhat of his role as a revelator, though not to the degree they would, because he had been receiving revelations. But I doubt that they understood really the grandeur of his calling as a seer, his ability to see and, and behold marvelous visions. They would come to understand this, such as this vision he sees in the Kirlin Temple, the vision of the degree of glories. Many of these things would help them to understand it, but in this early period of the church, they seem to be trying to come to an understanding of what it meant to have a prophet in their midst. In the midst of this, Joseph receives the marvelous revelation concerning the vision that Moses had. Moses chapter 1. Now Moses, everyone understood as a great prophet, and he was in particular noted for his experience at the burning bush and receiving the, the commandments and known as a lawgiver. But Moses chapter 1 gives us a larger picture of Moses' ability to be a prophet as he sees a vision of the creation of the world and every person and every particle in the world. He's given to understand what God's mission is, what his purpose and his glory is, and he has face-to-face -face interactions with God in a more intense way that we understand without Moses chapter 1. Moses chapter 1 revolutionizes the way we can understand Moses' experience as a prophet, and that becomes important as we understand Joseph's role as a prophet, especially in light of the Lord beginning to compare the two shortly after teaching them the kind of visions Moses had had as a prophet. The, much of this work happened in, in harmony, and you can see here a picture of where the, an old picture of uh, the homes where Joseph had been around, and, and today what the land looks like where his home was, and, and a map of the surrounding area. But within two months of receiving Moses chapter 1, and we're not sure exactly where he was when he received that, but within two months he moved to Fayette to live with the Whitmers to get away from persecution so he could go about translating the Bible more intently. And so here we see uh, what it looked like a uh, long time ago and today uh, in the Whitmer home where he did this. As he arrived in Fayette, he learned that Hiram Page had a seer stone through which he had been receiving revelations and claiming that these revelations were for the entire church. This troubled Joseph and it gave him and others questions as to what his role as a prophet was. He spent time seeking direction from the Lord, and section 28 was given to him as an answer to that, where he would clearly outline that he was the only one authorized to receive revelation for the entire church. But note the language that the Lord uses as he teaches Joseph, Hiram, and others about Joseph's role. He says, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church excepting my servant Joseph Smith. Junior, for he receiveth them even as Moses. Now, this would have meant something at any point, but coming on the heels of this marvelous revelation of Moses' experience as a prophet, and then to have Joseph compared to Moses must have changed the way they understood Joseph's experience as a prophet. If we had more time, we could look at more references to Joseph being like Moses and see how the Lord drew upon the information he had just given them to teach them about what was going on in Joseph's day and about Joseph. Instead, we'll now move on to things that they learned about creation. This is a very important doctrine that was not as fully understood then as we understand it now. Keep in mind that We've talked about how it seems that the reception of section 29 and the reception of Moses 2 through 3 were contemporaneous, and probably Moses chapter 4 received just thereafter, maybe even before section 29, we can't be certain. As we, we look at this, 
one of the things that they learn at the re, with the reception of Moses chapter 3 is that the Lord God created all things spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. They did not know that before that point. Here is where they learn of the spiritual creation and of the way the Lord worked there. However, that can come, uh, be taken in a couple of different ways, and it's possible that the saints could have misunderstood it. And so the Lord will soon give them more information. As section 29, which I believe is probably just after the reception of Moses 3, he says, He created all things, both spiritual and temporal. First spiritual, secondly temporal. He then goes on to talk about Adam. You could see how the saints might have thought, well, now that there's a physical creation, it's only temporal. Adam is cast out of the garden. He will only have temporal laws. But the Lord follows up this reception of Moses 3 with the information in section 29, which tells us, I gave unto him, meaning Adam, commandment, but no temporal commandment gave I unto him, for my commandments are spiritual. They are not natural nor temporal, neither carnal nor sensual. And so after getting a narrative that tells the story of what happened with Adam, with some doctrine taught in the middle, the Lord then gives them a doctrinal discourse on the creation and specifies some things about Adam and the nature of the spiritual and physical creation that Adam was a part of. Again, we could spend more time on that, but we'll keep moving. One of the concepts that is taught very clearly during this time period is uh, also in conjunction with the creation is about Satan and the fall. These were concepts that had come to be vastly misunderstood and it changed the way that, that Christians and Jews understood a number of things. It was important to, to gain a correct understanding of the fall and Satan. In section 29, the Lord said, Satan had rebelled against me, saying, Give me thine honor, which is my power. And also a third part of the hosts of heaven turned away, turned he away from uh, me because of their agency, and they were thrust down, and thus came the devil and his angels. So there's some information, more information about how Satan had become Satan and about that fall and the temptations that would result than had been received before. But just after this, I, I think section, or Moses 4 is probably just after this, the Lord follows up, giving them more. Because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten I caused that he should be cast down. Similar information. Now, it's tempting to just look at Moses 2 through 3 and 4 and section 29 in isolation, but that would be ignoring an even larger picture. If we really want to understand how the Lord taught his saints about the fall we need to look at a, a picture that includes the reception of the Book of Mormon, uh, which had happened earlier but becomes available to the saints in March of 1830. That also contains teachings about the fall. And so if we're going to look at this full flow of teachings about the fall, we start there and consider it in conjunction with Moses 2 through 4 and section 29. In March then of 1830, from the teachings of Lehi, we learn that Satan was an angel who was cast down and that Satan had to tempt mankind. Then in somewhere through August, August through October, probably September, I believe, we get from Moses' teachings that Satan was cast down. Satan, we read of Satan tempting Adam and Eve and of Satan tempting Cain. And then we follow that up in the September revelation of section 29, revelation that teaches of Satan being cast down, being cast down and that Satan must tempt mankind. The Lord is teaching by repetition, but each time adding just a little bit more information. To highlight this, we'll just, we won't read all of these verses, but I've put in red some phrases that will just demonstrate how much the Lord is teaching about this. He teaches there must be an opposition, that we have to know the sweet and the bitter in order to understand things, that Satan was seeking for our misery and thus he would go on to tempt Eve. That's from 2 Nephi 2. Shortly thereafter, we learn in Moses 4 that Satan sought to destroy our agency and he wanted to deceive and blind men and thus he went on to tempt Adam and Eve and then Cain. From section 29, we learned that it was necessary that the devil should tempt us, that there had to be both bitter and sweet, and that the devil then tempted Adam. You can see how the Lord followed up one after the other, teaching the saints about this doctrine of the fall. And he does this in a very interesting way. First of all, we get in 2 Nephi 2 a doctrinal discourse. Then, I have a question mark here because we're not sure of the timing, but it seems next he gives a narrative that teaches about the fall, then a doctrinal discourse that teaches about the fall, and shortly thereafter in Moses 6, the end of Moses chapter 6, we get again a narrative that teaches about the fall and Satan and, and temptation. And so the Lord teaches doctrine, gives us a narrative, doctrine gives us a narrative as he attempts to teach the saints about this very, very important concept 
and by the end of this, they will have a better understanding of the crucial doctrine of the fall than has been had among mankind for millennia. The Lord emphasizes and teaches carefully line upon line through various revelations this concept. This happens even more so with the concept of Zion, and, and perhaps this is the most fascinating of all of them. The Lord is going to teach them about Zion, and when we think of Zion, one of the first things we think of is the city of Enoch, and the wonderful revelation Joseph receives about building the city of Enoch, and, and how that becomes Zion, and is taken up to be with the Lord. Curiously, it's not the first time that, that Joseph or the saints learn about Zion. So we have to ask ourselves, what did they know about Zion before the material about Enoch? Well. We hear about Zion in the Bible, but in the Bible, typically, it's a specific place. It's either Jerusalem or a part of Jerusalem. Sometimes it's a, an abstract concept, but generally, it's a specific place. The, Zion is in the Book of Mormon quite often, but most of the time, we find Zion in the Book of Mormon quoting the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah. So there's no inf new information gained there. Sometimes it's treated as an abstract concept, something like, you should labor for the welfare of Zion. And so this almost a building up of the kingdom of God kind of an idea. Now, the New Jerusalem is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and that's a concrete reference to a geographic location. They're told the New Jerusalem will be a city, which seems inherent in its name that it would be a city. However, and, and gathering will be associated with that. However, the two are not equated in the Book of Mormon, and we've often been mistaken about that. The Book of Mormon does not at any point say that Zion and the New Jerusalem are the same thing. The Savior came close in 3 Nephi 21, and we tend to read it that way knowing what we know in hindsight. But he talks about Zion a few verses later. He talks about the New Jerusalem. If the saints had not already equated those two, they would not do so through the Book of Mormon. They would not come up with the concept of Zion as a city from the Book of Mormon. So we ask ourselves, what did they know from the revelations that end up in the Doctrine and Covenants before the reception of the Enoch material? Well, all of the early references are abstract. Something like, seek to bring forth Zion, which could be taken as a city if you already think it is, but if not, I would guess you would take as the kingdom of God or, or a more abstract principle. The closest we come to a concrete reference is when Emma is told that she will have an inheritance in Zion. Again, this could mean a specific place, but if you're not thinking of Zion as a city or a specific place, this can very easily be taken as uh, a more as abstract concept of the kingdom of God. And my guess would be at least half of the application does intend that. Interestingly, it's section 28 that the, the Hiram Page, uh, the one associated with Hiram Page, that's where we first get reference to Zion as a city. It's given three months before the revelation on Enoch, uh, something we've missed before we've been able to get this timing down the way we have today. And so this comes before the Enoch material. And the Lord tells them that no one knows where the city of Zion will be built. Boom. The idea of Zion as a city comes forth. Now we have to ask ourselves, was this the first time or did the saints already have that idea? It is possible that they had the idea before. When the Puritans moved, they wanted to build a new Jerusalem. They wanted to build cities that would be a new Jerusalem, and some of them equated that with Zion. Uh, there were several groups who had tried to build a city of Zion. Notably, near Palmyra, there was a group that had tried to do that just before this time. In New Lebanon, there was a group that had tried to do that, and that's the place where the Smiths family had lived earlier. And interestingly, in Harmony, the town of Harmony gets its name from the Harmonists, who are a group who are trying to build a Zion and, and a consecration-like community. And so Joseph has certainly been in areas where this idea was prevalent. It may have just been part of his, under, his cultural understanding that Zion was a city. It may have been an assumption he brought with him. We don't know. It's also possible that the first mention comes from the revelations that Hiram Smith was receiving through the seer stone, which he was told came from Satan. We don't know much about the content of those revelations. Uh, as uh, the only thing we know is that Joseph tells us that he'd receive revelations about the order of the church and the upbuilding of Zion. Thus, it seems quite possible that in the, up, in the revelations about the upbuilding of Zion that Hiram Page was teaching the saints, he may have even talked about a specific place for Zion or a specific city of Zion. That would explain then why the, the Lord would say, no one knows where the city of Zion is, and then he goes on to say that the city would be near the Lamanites the borders of the Lamanites. Uh, that may be a way of the Lord saying, Hiram Page thinks he knows where it is, he doesn't know where it is, and the place he's been telling you is very wrong, it's way over here by the Lamanites. Uh, it, 
we may be wrong. He may not have tried to tell a place where Zion was, but that seems to be likely at this point. So we ask ourselves, how did the saints come to equate the city or Zion with being a city? And we have several possibilities. We don't know which is correct. It may have been just a product of their, their New England society culture. The idea that Zion was a city may have been something they grew up with. It may have been that they had equated Zion with the New Jerusalem on their own, and thus reading about the New Jerusalem in the Book of Mormon, they had come to equate it with the city. It may have been the result of the Hiram Page revelations, or it may have been that Section 28 was the first time that they understood that Zion was a city that they would try to build. In any case, from this point forward, they will learn a tremendous amount about Zion, and most especially as they very shortly thereafter received the revelation about Enoch. We've already read this, but keep in mind what Joseph said. To the joy of the little flock did the Lord reveal the following doings of olden time from the prophecy of Enoch. And then we received the wonderful revelation about Enoch building a city where they would be of one heart and one mind and no poor among them and eventually become so righteous that they were taken up to be with God. A beautiful image and a beautiful goal that was set for the saints. In many ways, this became the blueprint for Joseph Smith. He felt that it was his call to build Zion. He modeled himself after Enoch and felt that Enoch was a role model and that his job was to build a city, uh, a Zion-like city and community like Enoch had done. That revelation in many ways shaped Joseph's idea of what his mission was in life. So if we were to look at when the, this revelation is received, in particular about uh, Zion, we learn in Moses chapter 7, that's at the very end of December. Now the timing is important because we also get in section 37 this interesting information. Section 37, the Lord says, Behold, I say unto you that it is not expedient in, in me that ye should translate any more until ye shall go to Ohio. So he receives the vision about Enoch and then he's told, move to Ohio. We also read a commandment I give unto the church, that it is expedient in me that they should assemble together at the Ohio. So immediately after receiving the revelation about the city of Zion, they are told for the first time to gather in a specific place. Now this gathering will require them to start receiving lands, and the lands they will receive will be from consecrated lands. And so the, the idea of consecration in Zion will become a very new venture for the saints just after learning about Enoch. Note how shortly thereafter in section 38, we get some very important concepts. The Lord says, and again, I say unto you, let every man esteem his brother as himself. And then he starts to slowly introduce the principles of consecration and of a Zion-like society. In section 38, he's, they are told that certain men among them shall be appointed and they shall be appointed by the voice of the church and they shall look to the poor and the needy and administer to their relief that they shall not suffer and send them forth to the place which I have commanded them. This is the beginning of that Zion-like society that they are going to try to build. Even before that though, the beginning of the revelation, note the phraseology the Lord uses. I am the same which have taken the Zion of Enoch into mine own bosom. He has just told them about Enoch, and now as he begins to tell them about what they are going to do, he phrases it by saying, remember who I am, I brought Enoch to me. A powerful reminder that what he's going to ask them to do has been done, and he can help them do it, and of the rewards that are available if they will engage in this. Note also in section 38, more phraseology that was designed to evoke the um, the language of the revelation on Enoch. But behold, the residue of the wicked have I kept in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great city, which shall come at the end of the earth. Just before this, they had read in Enoch's vision, Enoch had beheld a vision of Satan standing with a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness, and he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. It seems that the Lord is again in section 38 as he prepares them for consecration in Zion, evoking the imagery of people who had already succeeded in building Zion. He also tells them there, I am in your midst and you cannot see me. It must have been immensely comforting, but even more comforting after they've learned that the Savior had been in the midst of the city of Enoch. It's also, he tells them, be one, and if you're not one, you're not mine. This just after they had learned that the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind. The Lord is continually reminding them of what he had done with Enoch that they had just learned about weeks before. 
And so the saints start to move to Kirtland. And as we said, they'll need places to stay as they move to Kirtland. Shortly after this begins, they receive section 42, the great revelation on consecration. You can see the revelation here. We're not going to go through the entire revelation, but if you're just to look at the section heading, which summarizes for us, you'll see the laws of consecration are set forth, and towards the end, consecrated properties are to be used to support church officers. But in the middle, we have a whole bunch of stuff about the translation of the Bible. The scriptures would govern the church, the site of the New Jerusalem, the mysteries of the kingdom shall be revealed, and often using, lang using language that specifically evokes the translation of the Bible. The Lord seems to be telling them that these revelations are in conjunction, that consecration that he is setting forth has been and will be further explained in the revelations they're receiving as they translate the Bible. Note a few examples. Thou shalt ask, and my scripture shall be given as I have appointed, and they shall be preserved in safely. This is in the middle of talking about consecration. He tells them, ask, and I'll give you more scriptures. Also, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge. Thou shalt ask, and it shall be revealed unto you in mine own due time, where the new Jerusalem shall be built. Now, here we see an example of a, of a consecration deed, and we know that the saints were moving and needing these uh, these lands, and it seems that as, well, section 42, many received with joy, some struggled with, but soon after they started to trying to implement it, and people were actually trying to consecrate lands and having other people come and stay in their lands, they met head on their own shortcomings and foibles and carnal desires. And for many, this must have been very discouraging. They probably asked themselves, can we do what Enoch did? Is that too lofty of a goal? We are having difficulty with this. In the middle of this, some interesting things happen. Section 42 is given uh, there at the, the beginning of February, and it would seem, if our estimations are close to right, that the week after that, they receive, they go through the Genesis, or the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14, wherein they are told, Melchizedek and his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven and sought for the city of Enoch. Now think of that, as they're trying to implement consecration and finding how difficult it is and perhaps doubting whether anyone else can ever do it, the Lord suddenly reveals to them that yes, someone else has tried to imitate the city of Enoch and they succeeded. You can do it too. It must have been an immense comfort to them and I believe would have given more saints the ability to sustain the prophet in his efforts to bring about consecration in Zion. We'll finally turn for the last few minutes to the talk, topic of Zion and the signs of the times. They are interrelated. And to understand this, we have to see that Moses chapter 7, 2 through 8 is received at the end of December. And then, as we said, uh, they receive several revelations in February, including and most notably section 45. So just about two months uh, after the reception of the, the vision of the city of Enoch. Now, in Enoch's vision, we learn about a great bifurcation of the people. The wicked become more and more wicked. The righteous become more and more righteous. And this becomes troubling for the righteous because the wicked are so wicked they want to kill them, but the Lord protects them in a marvelous way. What a comforting thought for the saints. They learn that he protects Zion. And then note in section 45, just a few months after learning about this, the Lord says, Hearken ye to the wisdom of him whom ye say is the God of Enoch and his brethren who were separated from the earth and were received unto myself, a city reserved until a day of righteousness shall come. He tells them this as he's about to tell them some of the horrific signs of the times, the terrible things that will come in their day. In section 45, they learn of these terrible signs. The love of men would wax cold. There would be many earthquakes. War, there would be wars in their own lands. There would be an overflowing scourge and a desolating sickness that would cover the land. That's somewhat daunting and depressing and must have been a somewhat of a source of anxiety for them. Yet, as the Lord is telling them about these things, he is reminding them that similar things had happened during Enoch's day and he had protected Zion. He tells them in section 43 or 45, gather together and with one heart and with one mind, gather up your riches that ye may purchase an inheritance which shall hereafter, hereafter be appointed unto you. More about consecration. And it shall be called the new Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the most high God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there and the terror of the Lord also shall be there insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it and shall, it shall be called Zion. This language mirrors that which happened uh, in the revelation about the city of Enoch, who became so terrible that the people were afraid of it and God protected them. 
having received this after seeing the example of Enoch's people must have been a source of tremendous solace and comfort for the saints. Now, I believe that the timing of these revelations were important, and often I've asked myself, why did the Lord have them start with the Old Testament and then stop and start with the New Testament? Why not just start with the New Testament? I'm sure that there are many answers to that, but I think that at least one of them is apparent in the things we've been talking about. Note the timing in this calendar, the latter half, you'll see the bottom half, we're going to look at the last half of the year 1830, and then we'll go to the top, which has the first half of 1831. In September, they learned that Zion is near the Lamanites. In October, they're told to go on a mission to Ohio and Missouri, and it is that mission that would then introduce people in Kirtland to the gospel, and the church would start to grow on Kirtland. In December, they receive the revelation about Enoch, and they're told to move to Ohio. In January, they're told more specifically to gather in Ohio. In February, they gather in Ohio, and they begin that, and they learn more about consecration, and they learn about how Melchizedek had also been successful in establishing a city of Enoch. Finally, in March, they learn about the safety that is available in Zion that is not available anywhere else. I suspect that the Lord wanted them to have the revelations about Enoch before they started to build the city of Zion. And that the, the need of moving, which would happen in early 1831, would necessitate the beginning of consecration as these saints needed land to live on. And so consecration had to begin in 1831. Thus, at the end of 1830, the Lord pours out revelations about Zion, so that as his saints are asked to build Zion, they have inspiration and understanding that would have been unavailable before then. As they receive this, the Lord can then say, now I have other things that you need to learn and begin the translation of the New Testament. My hope is that as we have gone through this, that we will come to a greater understanding that the flow of prophecy and revelation that came to Joseph Smith was not a little bit here and a little bit there, but all of these things should be gathered together uh, as they were for, for Joseph. He received them one after the other as he attempted to teach the saints. The beauty of this is that the Lord has not changed his pattern and that we continue today to have a prophet who receives inspiration and revelation for us as Joseph received what they needed in order to start to build Zion in the way they needed to then. So today, President Monson receives inspiration about what we need to do to build up Zion today. It's my hope that we can come to understand both the prophet Joseph's role and our current prophet's role greater by looking at what the Lord did with Joseph. And I pray for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.